In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Please be seated. We give thanks to you, O Lord Most High, for being made flesh in our midst. Amen. That your mercies endure forever, and that you found it fit to come and save us. Amen. Amen. May we be a people of the incarnation that the incarnate word made flesh may be made real in our lives and in this world. Amen. Amen. Good morning. All right. All right. We have made it back. huh? Y'all didn't eat too much. Didn't have too much figgy pudding. Didn't have too much eggnog. As good Episcopalians, I'm sure you had some eggnog but hopefully not too much. I want to talk to you today um, about the Psalms. And we notice about the Psalms that so many of the Psalms talk about praise the Lord and bless the Lord and, you know, praise God and, oh, sing to the Lord. And usually those psalms talk about praising and blessing and singing because of something that he has done for us, something that he has given us. You know, the entire uh, lection for today prescribes the, the whole of Psalm 147. So since it's not in your bulletins, I, I urge you to be like a Baptist and pull out your Bible and turn to Psalm 147 so that you can follow along because usually it's because of they say praise the lord sing to the lord because of something that he has done for us in our lives because of his goodness and yes that is true god is good all the time and all the time amen and yes Truly, his mercy endures forever, right? And so, yes, we sing to the Lord and we bless his name because of those things. But in this particular instance, if you look at verse 1 of the psalm, the psalmist tells us to sing a song simply because it is a good thing. He says, sing a song because a psalm is a good thing, period. And so if I were to title today's message, I would say, let your praise be pleasing to God. Let your praise be pleasing to God. Some might want to know why we're talking about this. We're in the incarnation now. We're talking about Jesus, baby Jesus and his golden fleece with his little baby Jesus powers and Batting at the flies with his baby Jesus fist, so cute and cuddly. We talking about baby Jesus right now. So why are we talking about this? Because in the incarnation, we talk about the coming one, right? The coming one. And I also want to talk about our coming apathy. And why we must have why God deems it necessary for us to have Christmas after Christmas after Christmas after Christmas ad infinitum until Christmas becomes something that we just simply celebrate. Because before long, we'll come down off our spiritual high. Everybody is up and we're jumping around. It's Christmas. You see me, I'm singing loud and stuff. But before long, we'll come down off our spiritual high. And before long, we'll return to our complacency, our apathy, and our indifference. But the psalmist says that a psalm is a good thing. A psalm is a song of praise, right? A psalm is a song of praise and A song of praise is a good thing. That is to say, a song of praise is useful to humanity. It has its benefits. It has a salvific purpose. It has a purpose in the course of salvation. It is a good thing. It is, 
in and of itself uh, fitting is what the NRSV would say. I think that's what most of you have in, the, in your pews. Fitting is what the NRSV would say. But it is in and of itself pleasant. It is fitting. It is pleasant. And so some translations, again, your NRSV will say it is pleasant, but the, the older translations will say let it be pleasant or may it be pleasant. Right. So I want to look at two different dynamics here. Let it be pleasant and it is pleasant. Right. It is pleasing. So what is his pleasure? Verse 10 and verse 11 says his pleasure. He shall not take pleasure in the strength of a horse, nor be pleased with the legs of a man or the speed of a runner. The Lord is pleased with those who fear him and with those who hope in his mercy or his steadfast love. And so the Lord's pleasure as identified in this psalm is that he takes pleasure in those who are obedient to his word and hope in his salvation. Not in the strength of a horse, not in the legs of a man, not in the speed of a runner, but in those who are obedient to his word and hope in his salvation. That is his pleasure. So why should it be pleasing? Why should the psalm be pleasing? Verses 2 and 4 give us a little glimpse. Through 2 through 4, the Lord is building Jerusalem and he shall gather together the dispersion of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up all their wounds. He numbers the multitude of stars and calls them all by name. Now, this seems kind of like an abstract context and con construct until we look behind the veil a little bit and ask ourselves who, what, where is Jerusalem? That is to say, the city of God. And we who believe in the incarnation and who are children of the incarnation hold that that city of God, Jerusalem, is the church. And so the Lord is building up the church and he shall gather together the dispersion of Israel, the chosen of God. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up all their wounds. He numbers the multitude of stars and calls them all by name. Write this one down in your notes section. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. 18 and 19 read as follows. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness of tempest, and to the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged the word should not be spoken to them anymore. When they came to Mount Sinai, Remember when the Israelites were on their track and, and Moses went up into the mountain to hear from God, they trembled down below because what they saw was so terrifying. He says, Paul says that you do not come to such a mountain. You do not come to such a mountain, but verses 22 through 24 says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Registered in heaven like we talked about last week. We talked, well, actually, we talked about at Christmas time when Jesus went, or Joseph and Mary went to be registered in, in, in Bethlehem as a prefiguring of our registration in, in heaven. That you have come to a mountain of the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. To God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than things than that of Abel. That is Jerusalem, right? So when the psalmist is talking about Jerusalem, that is what he's talking about. And so now, who are the people of the dispersion? But us. 
If we are the new Jerusalem, then the children of Israel, those of the dispersion, those who have been scattered, I mean, beloved amongst us, you all know this all too well, descendant of slaves, descendant of, of all sorts of atrocities, the dispersion. Children of the dispersion being gathered together. The, the psalmist says that the Lord gathers together the dispersed children of Israel. That's why the psalm should be pleasing because he gathers together the dispersed children of Israel. And like he said to Abraham, you will have descendants to number the stars. The psalmist says that there is a multitude of stars that he calls by name. Those children of, is of Abraham dispersed, scattered abroad like a multitude of stars. The Lord Almighty knows by name. He calls them together, calls together the scattered dispersion, and he knows them all by name. Verses 2 through 4 says all of that. Verses 12 through 14 of the same psalm, praise the Lord, O Jerusalem, praise your God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He who grants your borders peace and, fulfill, and fills you with the finest of wheat. We already established that Jerusalem, the city of God, Zion is the church, and so we can understand it that he strengthens the church. He strengthens the bars of the gates of the church with the might of his cross. He strengthens the church with his cross and he blesses your children within you. Oh, come on. Those of you who are parents, you all know that he blesses your children within you. Lord, have mercy. Good God Almighty. <laughs> you look back and you think about some of the things you done seen and witnessed and done gone through and, and labored over and toiled with with your children and you see that they still stand in. Lord, have mercy. He blesses your children within you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And he fills you with the finest of wheat. A little later, we will need and, and, and offer that finest of wheat, that bread come down from heaven, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. 19 through 20 also says at the back end of why your praise should be pleasing. Now, we talked about all of these flowery and wonderful reasons as to why your praise should be pleasing. 19 and 20 kind of gives it, gives it a little oomph to it, huh? He says, he who declares his word to Jacob, his ordinances and judgments to Israel, he did not do so with other nations, nor did he show his judgments to them. Beloved, as the descendants of Jacob, the mystical people of Jacob, the that we indeed, it is you indeed, O children of Israel, God's chosen to whom he speaks. But he indeed is the God and Father of all. Uh, we'll say that in the Eucharistic prayer. He is the God and Father of all. So he is loving and just towards all, whether they are in here or not. He is loving and just towards all. And so even unknowing, unchristian humanity benefits from his love. And even unknowing, unchristian, unchurched, out there humanity faces his judgment. Yet he has not been so gracious and merciful to others as he has been to us because he has made us aware of his justice. He has made us aware of his ordinances. He has given us the law. He has given us the prophets. He has given us Jesus Christ to show us the way. And so it is us who are held the more accountable. And that's why your praise should be pleasant. Because it is us who are held more accountable. Being in here, inside these walls on a Sunday morning, does not make us better off than those who are outside. As a matter of fact, beloved, it is worse for you in here 
than for those out there. Because as one of my favorite preachers says, St. John Chrysostom, God's great beneficence, his great goodness towards us becomes a basis for condemnation in our indifference. And so to say that another way, to know the way, to know the gospel, yet resist the gospel, or to offer superficial and half-hearted praise of the gospel is indifference. And so those of us who might be indifferent, it is us who are held more accountable. So let your praise be pleasing. You know, it is not his pleasure, those of us who are justified by our superficial works, you know, those of us who are validated by our jobs or by our physical prowess or by our social status in the world or our economic prosperity. It is not his pleasure even based upon what we may do in Jerusalem. Whether we serve at the table or whether we greet people as they come or whether we keep the church clean or whether we are part of the administration making sure that everything happens, whether we visit the sick and the needy or if we teach in Bible study, whether we count the money to make sure it's all allocated properly, whether we sing or even whether we preach. That is not his pleasure. And so the question comes to us, is your praise pleasing? Do you believe that simply coming here and or working here in the church is all that it takes? That because you show up on Sunday or even Monday through Friday and Saturday or you do this program or that program, that that is all that it takes? That because you come in here and you clap your hands and you sing a song and you make the sign of the cross and you genuflect reverently at the altar, that that is all that it takes? Or do you praise him while being obedient to his word? and living a godly life, one that is in expectant hope of his second coming. Beloved, let your praise, let our praise be pleasing to God. The refrain has gone around, some of us have heard it, some of us have said it, that we got to do better. Let our praise be pleasing to God. Let our praise be a life of obedience to God's word, of obedience to what the gospel imperative says, of obedience to what God's call is. Let our praise be a life living in expectation of his second coming. I said to you on Christmas Eve, he came in the incarnation in mercy. The mercy part is done. When he comes again, he comes in judgment. There will be no time to get it right when he comes the second time. So let your praise be pleasing to God now. Let it be more than song and lip service. Let it be more than whatever you think it has been. Let your praise be pleasing to God that a psalm would indeed be a good thing for you and for me. Amen. Jobbread.com is home to the online ministry of Father Jobbread. Journey with us through the wilderness to God's promised land. Subscribe now to Jobbread TV and receive all of his videos.